Welcome to For the Record, I'm Naomi Coles. Ten years ago this month, former Governor Scott Walker introduced a landmark piece of legislation that would throw Wisconsin into one of its most bitter political battles. Act 10 cut the paychecks of most public employees and stripped their unions of almost every collective bargaining right. It catapulted Wisconsin to the top of national headlines, sparked extraordinary protests, and led to the only gubernatorial recall election in the country where the governor survived the recall. Today, I'm joined by Milwaukee Journal Sentinel Capital reporter Patrick Marley and Jason Stein from the Wisconsin Policy Forum. Together, they were the Journal Sentinel State House reporting team in 2011 and went on to write the time period's definitive book, More Than They Bargained For. Today, we're looking back at a decade's worth of impact. Uh, Patrick and Jason, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, both of you were on the ground literally daily, as you told me, covering these protests, covering the Act 10 progress as it made its way through the legislature 10 years ago. And as you think back now, thinking back to your memories, the key moments, what are some things that stand out in your mind as this is what I remember from all those nights, all those days spent at the Capitol? I mean, you know, it was really interesting because uh, Jason and I caught wind of what was coming um, right as the Senate Republicans were being informed of it. And we sort of looked at one another and said, this is a big deal. And uh, understood that like maybe the public wouldn't have a full understanding of what's going on because collective bargaining can be somewhat esoteric to people who are, are maybe familiar with state government or don't have that in their workplace. And so we uh, had the story that night as we talked to senators who were clearly um, you know, understood the gravity of what was going on. Um, but, but never, even though Jason and I saw it as a, as a really big story, we had no idea how it would take off and just the size of these protests and how extended it would be, that it would lead to these massive recalls. I mean, and, and I think this, you could say the same is true of Governor Scott Walker and Republican lawmakers, even the Democrats who opposed it, no one thought that this would catch fire in the way it did in those, in those early moments. Yes. I don't think anyone's really used to the idea of having CNN like covering their workplace live. It's not what we typically expect to have happen in Wisconsin. I had a role in uh, credentialing media, you know, for covering those protests. Normally that means, you know, you, you get an outside reporter, you get, it means you got somebody from Wausau who, who's down at the Capitol for a day. You know, I was credentialing news outlets from Mexico and France and Norway again as you would know, in the Wisconsin State Capitol, that's not normal. Absolutely. And uh, Patrick, as you mentioned, um, there was just that idea that this is so much bigger than it seemed like at the time. Well, the state was facing a $3 billion uh, deficit at the time, and Walker was just coming into office and trying to figure out ways to deal with it. He saw uh, a key, str he wasn't going to raise taxes, he opposed that strongly. So he saw a key way to do it is to reduce the amount of money that um, the state gives to local governments, but obviously that would create budget problems for them. So uh, the way that he wanted to address it was by taking money away from um, workers on the take home front by making them pay more for their benefits. He, uh, he had talked about doing that on the campaign trail, but everybody had thought of it in the context of collective bargaining. Here he was essentially getting rid of most collective bargaining, only the, the tiniest sliver of it. And um, this elicited this huge reaction from unions. They had already planned to, to protest some parts of uh, his budget, but they really came in fast. And I think that everyone was surprised by how quickly they were able to organize. Also, the Senate Democrats gave them a lot of fuel by leaving the state. Uh, there was a special provision that required them to have 20 senators present to pass this bill as it was originally written. And they were just shy of that uh, with the Republicans. So when the Democrats left, they were unable to act, and that just gave air to this giant protest movement, and tens of thousands of people came in. What about standout memories from uh, silly things like the camel in the streets? Uh, to, I guess more momentous things like when it was announced that all of a sudden all the Democrat or the Senate Democrats are leaving the state. What What are some of those key memories for both of you? I think really when it sort of blew up is when the Senate Democrats left the state, and that's when you really saw it start to become. Um, both a national and international news story. And when you saw sort of outrage on both sides and, and really heightened partisanship and divisions, and we can talk about that. You saw things like, again, the Comedy Central uh, personages would be in town. Uh, you know, people like Jesse Jackson would suddenly show up and just be walking down the hallways. Um, you saw, 
these events in the state capitol getting attention that was similar to the protests that were happening for what was termed the Arab Spring um, in the Middle East, and which you know ultimately resulted in the the toppling of a dictatorship in Egypt. So I mean, you know, these it, it was surreal to be living through history in that sense, as we have been living through history in the past year, where you're aware in the moment that things are happening that will be remembered and will reverberate for a very long time. And I think you can't, like, it's, it's hard to remember just how chaotic it was at any given moment. You'd step out of the Capitol press room and into the hall, and it's just a wall of people. It's like being at a really crowded rock concert. And it's got the sound of that too, because people are banging on overturned buckets and uh, you know singing and chanting, and it's just echoing through the halls of the Capitol. So much so that when you know after being there for 14 hours, you would leave and you lay home in bed, and you just hear that sound echoing in your head. Um, you know, you had a 60-some hour debate on the floor of the state assembly that was quite raucous at time. At, at least at one moment, you had the assembly minority leader. Uh, wailing through a, a bullhorn because the um, the Republicans wouldn't recognize him. And so, you know, just these, all these little surreal scenes and you never as an individual could capture everything that was happening at once because while you're in the assembly chamber, you know, there's that camel out on the street and you have no idea. And then you see it on Twitter or you hear about it through a text message. Out of curiosity, how large was the Journal Sentinel team on, on any given day? So J Jason and I at the time were the uh, primary people covering the state capitol. So we were there every day and then they would bring in huge reinforcements. We'd have two, three, four, maybe even five reporters, a couple of photographers coming in every day. I mean, it would, in the early days especially, we um, ha had people here. And then also there were uh, lots of reporters in Milwaukee who'd be calling the Democrats who were down in Illinois or going to Illinois to, to try to talk to them in person. Um, so we had a huge team working on covering it. protests that might happen in Milwaukee as well, or or helping it, you know, happen in other parts of the state. How has the legislature makeup changed, and how has their lawmaking approach changed over the past decade? I mean, I think when people talk about Act Ten, they're really talking about a shift in perspective and governance that implies a whole constellation of changes. So, you know, along with Act Ten. You, you had later on in 2011, you had tighter limits put on local property taxes for cities and counties and on revenue limits for school districts. You had um, lower payments being made by the state to cities, counties, school districts. Um, you know, you had a, a number of other changes over time. Uh, right to work got put in place, which is legislation that sort of limited the power of private sector unions. You saw so you, you saw a lot of things happen. You saw tax burdens in the state go down. They're now at really um, the lowest level that they've been in at least 50 years. Um, you also saw our per pupil spending within the K-12 world go from above to below the national average, uh, which is sort of mirrors what would happen with taxes. Um, you see union membership in the state uh, drop that was already falling prior to Act 10, but public sector unions had been sort of a point of at least modest strength for, for unions in, in Wisconsin and in some other states, and, and those levels have, have fallen. So you really see sweeping changes that go through almost every aspect of state and local government. It's not due purely to Act 10, which was more limited in what it did, but certainly Act 10 kicked off a series of changes that eventually reached into many aspects of public life. I think that's an important thing to remember is that you know this was something that was done at the very beginning of a, a period of long Republican control of state government. You have very large majorities uh, in both houses of legislature and a Republican governor. And so you know, they were able to enact a lot of things that had been priorities to them for a long time, like concealed carry and voter ID that had nothing to do with Act 10. Um, and so it, I think, uh, in terms of where we are, in terms of governing, has perhaps as much to do with the fact that you had one party control for eight years as much as Act 10 or anything else. Yeah, I think that's a good point. The promise here was Walker wanted to pay the state's bills. He, he wanted to balance the budget. He, he wanted to put the state back in a strong fiscal position. 
Now, obviously, the big question that I know both of you reported extensively on is, did that happen? And at the end of the day, though, who, who paid for that? It certainly is the case that the state's finances became stronger in the wake of Act 10. <clears throat> if you look at um, general fund balances, you rainy day fund balances, you look at sort of spending versus revenues, if you look at, um, you know, in, in most ways, you look at debt levels with maybe the exception of transportation debt. All of those things improved in the wake of, of Act 10. <clears throat> and so I, when we went into this pandemic recession, um, I don't know that any, but anybody could have been prepared for COVID-19. It's just not something you can prepare for necessarily. But certainly the state was in a better position financially than it was at, at, at the onset of the Great Recession. Now, that being said, um, this was the longest period of economic expansion, you know, really in, in our lifetimes in America. So it's not surprising that the state improved its financial position over that period. But, but it's nevertheless the case that it happened. As for who, who paid for it, I mean, the, the central tenant of Act 10 was to make uh, public employees at the state and local level, for the most part, pay more uh, in health insurance and pay more for their uh, pensions. And so they're the ones who funded it. Their argument against Act 10 would be that there was it went far beyond a financial component because it took away all of the other aspects of collective bargaining. And so they lost the ability to uh, bargain over workplace safety or vacation time. Um, things like that. And so they say that it went further than it should have. And there, there can be some unexpected um, downstream effects of that. So for instance, if you're a teacher prior to Act 10, so much of what your life was at, in the workplace was based on your seniority. And so there was a real disincentive to shift districts because you'd lose your seniority. You know, in the wake of Act 10, that, that changed somewhat. And so I think we've seen more mobility of teachers. Now, if you're a district that is in a good financial position and really can compete for talent by offering attractive compensation, that may be a real benefit to you uh, because you're able to attract better teachers. You know, if you're a, if you're a rural district that where maybe uh, people are not, uh, young people are not as interested in living and you don't have the budget that some of your, you know, suburban districts might have, you know, you may struggle to compete for those suddenly more mobile teachers. So, you know, there were a lot of things that I think spun out of Act 10. Some of them you could predict, some of them maybe you couldn't, but they, they really are quite, quite sweeping and broad. Now, I think obviously as one of the reasons why Wisconsin was one of the states that was so nationally highlighted because of this, even while this type of legislation was being passed in other states around that time, before that, after that, was obviously the, the very strong union tradition in Wisconsin dating back decades. And obviously, uh, you know, there's been extensive research since then on the impact on unions. You know, we, we, we saw union membership decline, you know, and I, I, I believe there's research now that suggests that, that decline has kind of leveled off. What is the, I guess, what is the state of unions now, public unions in Wisconsin, and what's kind of the future that I guess that you would predict going forward for that? So prior to Act 10, about 14% of Wisconsin's workforce were um, uh, union members, and today they're about 8%. Now that's a combination of Act 10 and also right to work, which Jason mentioned affected the uh, private sector unions. Um, so you saw a, a very dramatic drop off right after Act 10, and then uh, another hit when right to work it came into play. And so it's, it's about leveled off. It's been a few years that it's been about 8% of the workforce. Um, those are 2019 figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We don't haven't seen numbers since the pandemic hit. Um, so, I mean, unions are greatly weakened. They're uh, not able to put in, have the political sway that they used to have in Wisconsin. I mean, I think one good example is that prior to Act 10, uh, the Wisconsin um, Education Association Council, which is the largest teachers union, had 16 lobbyists uh, working the state legislature. Uh, Today, their registration is two, two lobbyists, so a big reduction there. Um, in campaign spending, they're not the force they once were. Uh, they used to you know, be one of the big dogs in political fights. They're, they're less than they used to be. Yeah, I think all that's true. I mean, it's important to point out that union membership was falling 
prior to Act 10. So it, it's not as if it would have necessarily stood, stood that it would still be where it was at in 2010 if Act 10 had not happened. Um, that said, it certainly, it certainly further weakened um, their position. You know, in terms of what happens going forward, as, as union membership gets smaller, it gets more concentrated in the areas where it was strongest all along. So to some degree, it may be, it is so small that at this point that it may be more resistant. Um, you know, I mean, at the same time, um, you know, there have been organizing happening around some of these issues in different ways. For instance, school referenda have been very, uh, school districts and their supporters that would include teachers unions have been very successful in passing uh, referenda. So to local voters that they agree to raise their own property taxes so that school districts will have more funding for education. You know, so that's a trend that we've seen in recent years. So although I think in general, you'd have to be, you'd have to paint a pretty pessimistic picture about how all of this has gone for uh, labor supporters, you know, at the same time, there are some trends that you can point to that suggest they're still um, exercising a major influence over public policy and public life. Is it fair to characterize that influence as with Act 10 taking away the legal bargaining right outside of um, inflation based raises? Is, is it reasonable to describe it as a softer influence, a, a softer, more political influence rather than influence based in a, a legal basis? I, I mean, um, you know, there's still there's still significant players in Wisconsin elections. They still, you know, they can influence a, a Democratic primary. The national unions still have money, so they can put money into Wisconsin. Wisconsin remains a swing state. You know, there was um, lots of money spent in the 2020 presidential election, which Joe Biden won by a very narrow margin here. And so, you know, there was all kinds of spending from all sorts of groups. You can't, you know, it's not like the the unions have been completely wiped out. Um, but they've but they have less strength than they used to. Yeah, I guess what I would say is clout is clout. So, you know, if you're, if you're the man, if, you know, if you run a large paper mill in a small Northern Wisconsin town, you don't have any legal mechanism for influencing your local school district, but you may still have influence just because you're a major employer, people care, you know, pe people care about you and what you think. Uh, for good reason, right? Because you're important to the community. In the same way, a teacher's union that has influence in getting school board members elected will still exercise influence over the process. There won't be necessarily a legal mechanism or you know, there won't be arbitration or mediation that's required when there's a dispute between the school district and the school board and the teacher's union. But to the degree that they can exercise influence, just like any other group or organization within within the community, they're still going to be able to do it. And I think what you'd see is that that is, is going to vary at the local level quite a bit from one community to another. In Madison and Milwaukee, the teachers unions still have a lot of influence at the local level. Maybe in some more rural places or suburban areas, uh, they're, they're not the factor that they used to be. So I think it really can change from one, one spot in the state to another. Now, Jason, I know you mentioned kind of a string of impacts a little bit earlier on in the panel as far as what Act 10 and follow-up legislation had. If both of you were to pinpoint what you would see as the most significant, when you think about school spending, when you think about local state, uh, local budgets, state budgets, union influence, all those different kind of the balloon of influ uh, impact that Act 10 and follow-up legislation had, what's the most significant in your view? Money is, is always important in life. And you look at the pension and healthcare contributions that additional payments that uh, state and local workers made and that lowered state and local government spending on those programs, just the pension benefits alone, the increased contributions into the Wisconsin retirement system added up to about $5 billion between 2011 and, and 2017. It's continued to be about a uh, billion dollars a year in higher pension contributions since then. That doesn't even include the, the health insurance. So that's, that's very significant. Um, in addition, 
uh, we have a well-funded retirement system in the state, but there have been unfunded um, retiree health care liabilities that many school districts and local governments have carried. Those have come way down in the wake of Act 10. Some of that, I think, would have happened anyway, but it likely contributed to that. Um, those have been decreased by billions of dollars as well, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. So, you know, in terms of financial impact, there you can point to that. And, and that also transfers over to the workers themselves who, you know, often saw in the, you know, eight to 10% range, depending on what their salaries were, drop in their, their take home pay before taxes. So those are all, I think, uh, very significant impacts, probably have some impact on recruitment and retention of public employees. So that, those would be, you know, some of the things that I would point to just in terms of the big ticket items. Yeah, I, I would agree that the financial components are the biggest lasting effect of Act 10. Um, but, you know, the, the effects on unions are pretty intertwined in that and, you know, are, are, are a, a very close second. I think you, you can't, um, you can't underappreciate how important unions uh, were in Wisconsin prior to Act 10. I mean, we were uh, the birthplace of, of um, collective bargaining at the at the local level, and you know it seemed like a, a position that had been in place for so long that it was not going to change, and it was a really dramatic change from from what we had seen uh, prior to Act 10. And I think that speaks to just the I think the division um, we see in Wisconsin now that. Perhaps didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the political division, I mean, this all came about as a rise of, you know, the Tea Party movement is propelling these particular um, lawmakers at, a, at a both a state and a, even a federal level around the same time. I guess as we think about the decade since, and as we look forward, we have a steeply gerrymandered state, uh, but we, we have a Democratic governor, we still have a Republican controlled legislature. How, do we ever see Act 10 repealed under that kind of scenario is the first part of that question. And the second part of that question, I think, is we, you know, we have a Democratic federal administration and uh, labor union rights are, are union rights, labor laws. Those are a big priority of that administration. Do we see that trickle down to Wisconsin in any way? So kind of a big two parter question to kind of finish this up. So I, I, there's no way that Act 10 gets repealed if you have Republicans controlling any part of state government. It would only happen if you had a Democratic governor and Democrats controlling both houses of the legislature. And even then, it may be difficult. Uh, it may be extremely difficult. You know, I think you'd have to have pretty sizable majorities. Because keep in mind that there were, there were times when Republicans had the legislature and the governor's office and they didn't. Uh, attempt to do something like this. So you, you'd have to have a, a large uh, majority. It'd be very difficult. At the federal level, um, you know, if uh, the federal government couldn't undo Act 10, they could pass some policies that would be more labor friendly and that would help uh, the unions in Wisconsin. Um, a very tight margin, in particular in the U.S. Senate right now. So I don't know uh, what the chances are of anything like that happening in the near term. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Patrick that it's, I think it's very unlikely that it would ever be repealed in Wisconsin. I mean, really you haven't even among, you know, Governor Evers has not really made um, a push in that, that regard. Uh, now you might, it might be different if there were a democratic legislature. Um, in, in terms of just labor policy more broadly, you know, it's not really my area. You do see some discussion of whether or not the United States would move in a direction like Europe, where instead of being organized around bargaining around just a single employer, that it's more within a sector of the economy that, that union membership and, and bargaining takes place. Um, it certainly would seem that the old model of um, labor organizing and influence has been really substantially weakened, not just in Wisconsin, but it, Wisconsin was really the first state to sort of pursue these changes that were also pursued in many other states, uh, some successfully, some not, but uh, in 2011. So, you know, the, the time will tell on that, but, but certainly um, the state has, there's no, there's no sign that the state is moving in a different direction on this in the near term. All right. Uh, as we kind of wrap this up, um, any follow-up thoughts, anything you'd like to 
add to this that we may not have touched on yet? I, I don't know that I have anything. I think you covered it very well. It's, it's, I mean, well, I, one thing we didn't talk about were the recalls. Act 10 launched this, you know, historic wave of recalls. We've never really have seen, have not seen anything like this at the, um, let me say that again. Nationally, you've not seen a recall targeted over a single issue like this against lawmakers and a governor and lieutenant governor, first lieutenant governor to face a recall, first lieutenant governor to win one, Scott Walker, the only governor to win a recall election. I think there were 13 um, Senate recalls over two years, most of them won by the incumbents, but uh, the Democrats did have a, a short-term victory in 2012 by winning the state Senate for a few months. Um, you know. And as Walker points out, he won his recall by a bigger margin than he did in 2010. And I think that stiffened the spine of Republicans. They felt like they had taken this bold move and it had, you know, they, they had been okay at the ballot box after that. And so as they looked ahead to the next years of controlling government, they weren't shy about wielding that power because they felt that the public was behind them. Yeah, well, what I would point to is you know Act 10 in Wisconsin ushered in an era that that we see nationally today, which is a time of increased partisanship, uh, increased division, um, a period of I think both uh, Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, feeling that the other side was not merely incorrect, but also fundamentally uh, wrong, fundamentally at odds with um, what should be a shared set of values. And so again, um, the attempt to really undo all collective bargaining was taken by you know, outraged Democrats. When the Senate Democrats went to Illinois to block a vote, and then later there were the recalls, <clears throat> that outraged Republicans. I think in some ways the state in the years that followed sort of came back from that, at least in terms of tone and just basic civility that was lost during Act 10. But I think again, we're in we're in a period like that now. And it's it's frankly somewhat hard to see our way out of this period. Um, but I think it is it is toxic to bipartisanship, it is toxic to um, a, a feeling of shared collaboration and work towards, you know, shared goals and values, and it's something that I that I hope eventually returns. I definitely think it's fair to characterize the state of politics in Wisconsin and nationwide right now as a very different era than we might have had 10 years, 20, 30 years ago. On that note, um, I'm going to wrap this up. I really appreciate you both, uh, both of you bringing your expertise to this subject and talking through some of these changes that have happened over the last decade. Thanks for having us on, Naomi. Our pleasure, thank you.